Dr. Dwayne Litvin is the President Emeritus of Wheaton College in Wheaton, Illinois. He served for 17 years in that capacity as their seventh president. He holds an undergraduate degree in biblical studies from Cairn University and a THM from Dallas Theological Seminary. His two doctorates are from Purdue University, where he earned a PhD in rhetoric theory and communication, and Oxford University, where he earned a doctorate of philosophy in New Testament. He came to Wheaton from Memphis, Tennessee, where he served the Evangelical Church as senior pastor, the first E-Free Church there in Memphis. Prior to that, he spent a decade, 10 years, as associate professor of pastoral ministries here at Dallas Theological Seminary. His writings have appeared in numerous journals and periodicals. He's the author of several books, most recently, Conceiving the Christian College and Word versus Deed, Resetting the Scales to a Biblical Balance. His book, Paul's Theology of Preaching, uh, is due out this next year. He and his wife, Sherry, have three married children and nine grandchildren. In the intervals between family responsibilities and writing and speaking and teaching, he enjoys a good game of golf and recreational reading. It's a privilege to have somebody who knows what being a president is about on our board. That brings uh, a great sense of uh, challenge, comfort, wisdom, and help. And uh, I'm delighted to introduce a friend, Dr. Dwayne Litvin. Dwayne, come on. Would you? Would you turn with me in your Bibles to uh, 1 Peter chapter 5? I want to read with you a beautiful, powerful, poignant passage that is familiar to us all. 1 Peter uh, chapter 5, reading together verses 1 through 4, these familiar verses. To the elders among you, Peter says, I appeal as a fellow elder, a witness of Christ's sufferings, and one who will also share in the glory to be revealed. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, serving as overseers, not because you must, but because you're willing as God wants you to be. Not greedy for money, but eager to serve. Not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. The last time I stood in the pulpit in the chapel of Dallas Theological Seminary was 45 years ago next spring. I was one of the four senior preachers for that week at the end of my senior year at Dallas Theological Seminary. When it was announced that uh, I was among the four, it took me aback, and I made my way into the office of Dr. J. Elwood Evans, who was in charge of Senior Preaching Week at that point, and tried to beg off. (laughs) And I said to him, Dr. Evans, you got to know, he said, I have enough trouble already in my life with my motivation in preaching, the last thing I need to do is to step into the pulpit uh, competing for a prize. (laughs) Uh, I didn't get anywhere. (laughs) In effect, what he said to me was, deal with it. (laughs) He said, you're going to be spending the rest of your life wrestling with your motivation when you step into the pulpit. You might as well deal with it now. If you want to graduate, be ready to go into the pulpit. And so I stepped up and did it. But as I look back on that experience of of preaching in chapel, it's almost humorous to me because I bit off a passage that was way over my head. I preached that senior sermon on eschatology (laughs) in the chapel of Dallas Theological (laughs) Seminary. I preached on Ezekiel chapter 37, the vision of the dry bones. (laughs) And I can still remember out of the corner of my eye watching Dr. P uh, squirming in his chair. (laughs) 
Uh, I'm quite sure I didn't get it right. I did not cross the T's or dot the I's as I should have. And I realized that later that I was over my head in taking on that passage as a senior preacher. So I want to take another swipe at it here today. <laughs> but I've learned my lesson. I'm not going to look at uh, Ezekiel chapter 37. But I do want to take up the subject with you this morning, the subject of eschatology. But I'm going to aim at a much less ambitious goal. What I mean by eschatology this morning, by the term what I have in mind is a, a much simpler and more basic eschatological scheme. It's the eschatological scheme we find embedded in this passage that we have before us this morning, 1 Peter chapter 5 and verses 1 through 4. Did you pick up as you read this passage again how eschatologically oriented this passage is? The simple framework that shapes this passage is that classic framework that is all through the New Testament, all through the book of 1 Peter, and all through this particular set of verses. This age in the age to come. Cross time and crown time. That's the framework I'm interested in this morning. As I say, it's a framework that really informs the entire New Testament. Everything we can know about the Lord Jesus and his ministry. It touches everything. It leaves nothing untouched. You see it working itself out in the ministry of the Lord Jesus who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. Cross time before crown time. You can see it right here in this passage as Peter makes reference, uh, talking about himself and putting it in the context of the sufferings of Christ and the glory that is to be revealed. And Peter himself is participating in that. He saw the sufferings of Christ and he experienced already the sufferings of Christ. And Jesus had told him, uh, the way in which he was going to show the glory of God in the way he died, John chapter 21. Peter knew about cross time, but he was also living in the light of crown time, becoming a partaker, he says in verse 1. He will share in the glory that has to be revealed. Peter himself is thinking in terms of cross time and crown time. Crown time's coming, but right now we live in cross time. It's all through this book. The recipients of this book. You look at some of these earlier passages in this book. Beloved, don't be surprised at the fiery ordeal that's coming upon you. As though some strange thing were happening to you. But to the degree that you share in the sufferings of Christ, cross time, keep on rejoicing so that at the revelation of his glory you may rejoice with exultation. Crown time's coming, but you're living in cross time today. True for these recipients. True for the Apostle Paul, he talks about it all through his writings. It's like in Timothy, I have fought the good fight, I've finished the course, I've kept the faith. In the future there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness. He lived in crown, cross time, but crown time was out ahead of him. It's true everywhere and for everyone who names the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. James says, blessed is the one who perseveres under trial, for once he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Do you see the pattern? The cross before the crown, crown time's coming, but we live in cross time. That is the theme, and it covers the range of biblical revelation. I think of that great framework uh, just a few chapters back in Hebrews chapter 11, we have this great hall of fame of faith, this, this account of person after person after person who is living by faith. And the writer to the Hebrews says, all of these were living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance. They admitted that they were aliens and strangers living in cross time, in effect, their entire lifetime. It was only later that it was demonstrated they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. 
Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. They lived in their version of cross time with crown time out ahead of them. This is a universal premise for all of us as believers. And it is the framework of cross time and crown time, the cross before the crown, that you have to understand then the instruction that we receive here in this marvelous little passage of 1 Peter 5 and 1 through 4. Oftentimes we miss that. We sort of rush right to those three little couplets, those three contrasts that form the heart of this passage. Not this way, but this way. Not this way, but this way. Not this way, but this way. We rush to those, but we lose sight of the fact that, wait a second, those are set in the context of the cross before the crown. If you serve this way, if you exercise spiritual leadership in this way, then the crown is waiting for you. The crown of glory that will never fade away. It's the cross before the crown, and what he's describing in those three cutlets, couplets is that this is what cross time spiritual leadership looks like. Wherever you're going, whatever kind of ministry you're going to be engaged in, if you're about the business of spiritual leadership, this is what cross time leadership looks like. We live in cross time, not crown time. I think, frankly, that those of us who live and work and minister here in the, the U.S., we're not really very well equipped to talk about cross time. We have not spent a lot of time thinking about living in cross time because, frankly, we've had the luxury of living in an America where we had an environment that was hospitable and congenial to us and what we represent our whole world view. I want to say to you that's gone. The ministry to which you are headed, wherever you go, as graduates of this institution, you are going out into a very different world than the world I emerged into in 1970 when I graduated. We have turned a page and it is far more dramatic a turn than I think most American Christians really understand. I've been giving a good deal of attention to this recently because I'm, uh, I'm doing some thinking and writing and reading on this subject. I've got a working title for what I want to write, No Longer the Home Team, Living as a Christian in 21st Century America. You catch the theme, the, the metaphor, we are no longer the home team. We used to be the home team, and we could expect the people in the stands to be applauding what we do, even if they were not one of us. That's gone. We are no longer the home team, and we have no business expecting the people in the stands and American culture to be applauding us. In fact, just as it is with the away team on the court, you can expect to start hearing boos. And you may even be driven off the court. Everything has changed. I've been reading on this, and there are a whole series of really important books that address this subject. Reading uh, New Houses, The Naked Public Square, What's Happened in America. Uh, Michael Novak's the, the, the Two Wings. Some of Oz Guinness stuff. I, a whole series of really important books, but there's no book I've read on this subject that is more telling, uh, more effective in telling and helping us understand what has happened right here in our own culture, and it seems to have happened so quickly. In a book by Stephen Smith, who's at the University of San Diego. It's a recent book this year published by Harvard University Press. It's an academic book. It's entitled The Rise and Decline of American Religious Freedom. You, you will not understand what has come upon us unless you understand the theme of that book. And he picks it up right from the beginning, the founders and the Bill of Rights in 1791, what it was intended as, and the American settlement that grew out of that whereby the secularist voice and the providentialist voice were twin voices in, in fact, American culture. And the Supreme Court and the Constitution were seen as a protector for these twin voices, and both voices were viable in shaping polity and policies, including government and everything government touches. Both were viable, and we were entering into that period for 150, 70 years of open contestation. Politically, one would be up, the other would be up. 
but both were viable voices in America and American society until the middle of the 20th century, when finally this secularist voice, which had been gaining great strength among the elites, particularly the intellectual and legal elites of American society, whereas the population as a whole was still dominated by the providentialist uh, mindset and worldview, the elites eventually gained control in the middle of the 20th century, control of the Supreme Court, and then began interpreting the, Supreme, uh, the Constitution accordingly. And as of ever since 1947, a series of decisions that came through the 50s and 60s, this secularist voice that had always been there, along with the providentialist voice, was deemed orthodoxy. And the providentialist voice was banished, delegitimized. It was the unorthodox and the Constitution thereby, which had always been a protector of the providentialist voice as well as that secularist voice, the Constitution in the hands of the secularist agenda became a club beginning in the middle of the 20th century where everywhere that providentialist voice spoke in the public square and government, all the way through formerly government and the courts, out into the courthouses, state, local, all the way out into the creches in the public parks, the public schools, everywhere, wherever it appeared, the religious voice, that providentialist voice, unconstitutional, unconstitutional, that has happened in my lifetime. America prior to my lifetime was not like that at all. It was dramatically different. The providentialist voice had free reign and was a shaping influence, not only in culture in general, but even in jurisprudence. That changed in the middle of the 20th century. And uh, we are living in the result. And we are, frankly, uh, 75 years into this, with that secularist uh, worldview and the presuppositions baked into 75 years approach, approaching uh, of American jurisprudence and American culture to where the average American today think America has always been like this. It hasn't. And it's not just nostalgia. This is not a nostalgic book that he's writing. It's a technical piece of scholarship. He's not making special pleading for Christians. This is not a hand-wringing book. It is simply a description by a legal scholar of what took place. Read that book and you will understand the seriousness of the changes that have come upon us. And you will understand the world in which you are going out to minister. I think sometimes of the men of Issachar who are noted for the fact that they understood the times and therefore they knew what to do. Do you understand the times? Do you understand your times, this world now, that you're going out to minister? We are never going back. The idea of take America back, nonsense, not going to happen. This is the place to which Christ has called you. This is the world in which you live if you are going to minister in 21st century America, much less elsewhere in the world. Are you ready truly for what it means to minister in cross time, to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow the Lord Jesus. I don't think a lot of American Christians have really thought this through. We are not well equipped for this. We have found it too easy, too comfortable. What does it mean for us to live and work in cross time? Other Christians and other times and places. You realize most Christians in most places and most times have lived profoundly out of step with their cultural moment. We are the only ones who look at this happening and say, what's wrong? Something is wrong. It shouldn't be like this. Excuse me. This is the natural condition for the Christian. To living out of step with the world around us and representing Christ in the midst of that, not hiding from it, not ghettoizing ourselves, not disengaging, doing everything we can to be salt and light, staying engaged, loving our neighbor, voting, speaking up, but all the while realizing that increasingly we are going to know more and more what it means to minister in cross time in America. And it's in that context that we come to this passage and these marvelous three little contrasts. Because what he's describing for us is what ministry looks like when we are ministering in cross time. If you are engaged in the business of spiritual leadership, much less leadership elsewhere, this, Peter says, is what your leadership is called to look like. Let's look briefly at those three contrasts. First of all, 
not because you must, but because you're willing as God wants you to be. That is with a submissive spirit, an obedient spirit, called of the Lord, and with that sense of call, I'm doing what the Lord has called me to do, and I will be obedient. I wish we had time to really develop this. I've really come to think in terms of what I sometimes call the Nehemiah principle. Nehemiah had to build this huge wall. Nobody thought he could do it. He assigned the clans and families and individuals to building the wall. And the wall went up as each part did their part of the wall. What is your part of the wall? The needs of the world are so vast, they're like that wall, they're undoable. We don't have to do the whole wall. We only have to do our part of the wall. What is the part of the wall that Christ is calling me to do? That's what you need to be looking for and asking about. A need is not a call. There are all kinds of needs you can't possibly meet. What is the part of the wall that Christ is calling you to build? You discover that and then you give yourself to that willingly, whatever the cost, in obedience to the call of Christ upon your life. I would love to spend some time developing that. A second contrast that he lays out for us. Not greedy for money, but eager to serve. Not only obedient to the Lord Jesus Christ in his call, but selfless when it comes to this business of serving others. Spiritual leadership in cross time is not about you. And it is so easy when we get into leadership and the higher the position of leadership, I can tell you, uh, people give you more and more deference and they put you up on this pedestal and there's even oftentimes income and power and prestige that goes with it. You can so easily get sucked into thinking this is about you really and the reason they're here is to serve me up on that pedestal. That is deadly. Uh, leadership in cross time is about a, a profoundly submissive and obedient spirit of Christ and a selfless heart toward those Christ has called you to serve. It's not about you. It is about them and your service of them under Christ's call. And there is that third one, not lording it over them, but in fact, living as examples to the flock. Here again, we could spend the rest of the day talking about this, what it means to lead by virtue of your mind. I, I tell you, it irritates me no end. Here are some hipster young pastor in jeans and a t-shirt <laughs> under the guise of transparency talking about the mess that his own life is in order to identify with the people. I'm just like you. I've actually heard parishioners, people in the pews say that. I want a pastor just like me. I don't want a pastor up there. I want a pastor just like me. I'm saying that's disastrous. I don't want a pastor just like me. I want a pastor who's better than I am. I want somebody I can look to and say, that's what I should be. Someone who can say before Christ with all of his shortcomings, like the Apostle Paul, be imitators of me, even as I am of Christ. The essence of how we lead in spiritual leadership, in cross time, is leading by our model. And that is costly to live in that kind of a fishbowl that people are looking to you and I have an obligation not only to the Lord, but to them, to set a model for them. That is costly and demanding. It's part of what we're called to, serving in cross time as spiritual leaders. One of my favorite stories, the story of World War II. George Patton, General Patton was having a conversation with General Omar Bradley. And Patton was complaining that he was soon going to be out of work there in Europe. And Bradley said, don't worry, MacArthur will put you to work out in the Far East, which was far from done at that point. And Patton said to Omar Bradley, no, he won't. And Bradley said, well, why not? And Patton proceeded to tell Omar Bradley a story of World War I, when Lieutenant Patton was serving under Captain MacArthur. And they were leading a platoon of infantry at that time, and they had been assigned to take an enemy position up a, a fortified hill, and there was no other choice but at some point to rush that enemy position. And so as that platoon were called to their feet and they began rushing up their hill, there came withering fire down the hill, and the entire pl platoon fell to the ground, hugging the earth, except for two men, Captain MacArthur and Lieutenant Patton. 
still on their feet, urging those men forward. And all those years later, General Patton said to Omar Bradley, MacArthur never forgave me for that. I love that story. It's really a story about the ego of Douglas MacArthur. He wanted, uh, Patton was stealing his glory. He wanted to be the only one still on his feet. And here was Patton right there with him. But what I love about it more is what a picture of leadership that is. You, out in front, still on your feet, saying to the people you lead, come this way, follow me. Leading by your motto. You can't lead from the middle, much less behind. You can put a switch at the back of people's legs. That's not leadership. You lead by your motto, by being who Christ calls you to be, so that people can look at you. And yes, this is not a, 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 an argument for living behind a mask. It's an argument for living with such integrity that when you, your mask is apart and people see who you really are, they look at that and say, I want to be like that. That's what I want to be. This is what it means to lead in cross time. You can see Peter calling these spiritual leaders to a cross time ministry of a profound sense of obedience and a willing heart to serve wherever the Lord puts us, not looking for places that serve our purposes, but living obediently to Christ. A selfless ministry that says, I'm here to serve them, not the reverse. This is not about me. It's about what Christ has called me to do in the midst of this group. All the while setting the pattern of that model, a Christ-likeness, living for him and with him, empowered by his spirit so you can turn to the people behind you and say, come this way. And they're willing to follow your model. I want to say, as you leave this place, you're going out into a very different world. We are, I think, one very thin thread, one Supreme Court justice, Justice Kennedy, who wavers at best. If you read the decisions, the Hobby Lobby decision, if you read the Wheaton College HHS decision by Justice Ginsburg and Justice Sotomayor, you realize exactly what you're up against with one more Supreme Court vote. The tsunami will be upon us, of the dominance of this secularist voice. And you are in the way. And the gospel you preached and the life you live and the word you stand on is in the way. And you are going to be marginalized, demonized, delegitimized in every possible way. It's happening all around us. The situation in Houston is exactly about that. It's all about bringing down the spotlight of disapproval of the culture by the putting down of these subpoenas. There are no thought those subpoenas were going to work. This is about outing these churches and the voice that is now so profoundly out of step with where our culture is. That's just going to keep on going on. You're going to see it more and more. There's no doom and gloom here, no wringing of our hands. We are called to live in cross time. And as we serve and minister, especially in spiritual leadership in cross time, it is going to require of us ever more in the decades ahead, this submissive spirit and obedient spirit as we serve others in Christ's name, selflessly willing to stand up and be counted in the setting of a model for them in how to live in cross time. Let's pray together. Our Father, we confess we know so little about cross time. Other believers down through history have known all about cross time. If we look at other parts of the world, the Middle East, North Africa, India, Indonesia, China, the believers there, they can tell us all about cross time. We here know so little about how to live in cross time. Would you teach us, Father, not least from this beautiful, powerful little passage, reminding us of what spiritual, look, spiritual leadership looks like as we follow Christ for the joy that's set before us that we deny ourselves, take up our cross and serve him. We pray this for Jesus' sake. Amen.